Uh, yeah, I think that that is there. Um, all right, so let's see. Where's my mixer? Um, Oops. Okay, just a second. Oh, here it is. Okay, so let's bring a new marker. So you can, is that clear? Yes? Right, I can. Can you hear me? Yeah, I just don't know why anyone else is responding. Uh, all right. So, what we we're looking at last time was um, uh, echo potentials that loop kind of like. More like a circle. So this one's a little bigger, this one's a little tighter. And so we have the same value for the potential here and here, here and here. And so eventually it kind of meet at one point. So this is a two-dimensional surface. So now we're gonna look at it um, in, we're gonna do a, a, a cut across uh, this section. Well, actually only this part. Okay, so. Hey, Dr. Munoz, I have a question. Yes. There's that little cross, uh, I forgot what it's called, the Lagrangian, I think. Does that land on the center of mass? It doesn't matter that much. Uh, you know, we're just going to look at a at a cut. But yes, you know, for for simplicity, you can imagine that that is the case. So, if I want to draw these, plot it. Um, so over here I have the effective potential, uh, phi, capital phi, and over here I have um, distance. So, you know, we had the, that the point x was uh, two-dimensional, but here let's just consider the direction x. Um, how is that? potential going to look like in this axis. What are the two potentials that we have over there? We had phi the gravitational potential, and what else? The... You can call this centrifugal potential, something like that? Yeah, centrifugal, so I think it was... Uh, okay. mm. Actually, I'm not gonna use that. But yes, the centrifugal, so let's call it um, I don't know, this other one that I just invented. So how does the gravitational potential look like as a function of distance? It's proportional to what?
What is the dependence with X? The distance from the from the message. One over X, right? Yeah. What about the other one? The centrifugal. The one is one over X squared. And this one is negative, uh, so it's attractive. And this one, uh, it's positive, it wants to um, escape. So if we plug these two functions. Is it going to look like Leonard Jones? Everything looks like Leonard Jones. Yeah, right? Yes. So use. Red. So it's negative and it's one over x, so it looks like this. And it's not very bright. Right. And the other one, well, it looks like. Um, it just decays faster. And it's positive, right? So like that. Yeah. So and I don't know if that plot really shows the point, but so if you put them together, they're gonna look um, like a Leonard Jones potential. It's gonna look Kind of like that. So this is your uh, effective potential, and this is your uh, your distance. So there are a few interesting things that you can see over here. So if you go in steps of you know the same potential, let's say that you start. Uh, from here and then move to here and then to here. They're supposed to be the same distance. Um, over here you have just a point. Over here you have you know, uh, an, an ellipse. And the higher in energy you go, the more elongated the ellipse is. So very close to the bottom, it looks just like a circle, and it becomes more and more elongated as you move up in, uh, in this potential. So if you, if you had something like, mm, let's say, uh, a ball that you put over here and it moves to, it's gonna to move to the bottom, right? Because of the, the potential is lower here. So if you remember your physics 2420, where are you going to have your, um, how do you call these points? Uh, I don't remember my 2420. So the velocity changes direction. Critical points. No, they're not critical points. They're, they have a different name. What? But, you know, inflection so points? No, they're not inflection. Let me see if I'm right now. Um, see, I don't remember. My 2420 professor was pretty bad. I know. Turning points. Right, so if you if you put your ball over here, then it's gonna move down and it's gonna move up all the way over here, right? It's gonna keep doing that forever if you're not dissipating the energy. So this is your potential, and you can add some kinetic energy in there. So how does this translate to uh, 
to orbital dynamics. Well, you have the equilibrium point, I guess. So what happens at this equilibrium point? I guess the bodies are not moving further apart from each other or closer. Mm, so if if you're over here, um, oh no, they could be yeah. You're going to have a perfect circle, right? Okay. Um, and that would be like the lowest energy state of this system. Uh, but if you keep putting kinetic energy in there, then the orbits are going to become uh, larger and uh, more elliptical. So that is how uh, the kinetic energy, the extra kinetic energy, you know, it's accommodated uh, in the system. So... Wait, I have a question. Yes. How, how do you decide, like, how, how I guess, take the ellipses are, like the minor axis? How do you decide what? How strict? You know, how, you know the, the short side of the ellipse? Uh-huh. Like, how, how do you decide, like, how, how short you make it? How short? I yeah, so I guess, I guess in that graph would be, like, the vertical axis. How do you decide where to put it? Yeah, so, so you have those ellipses, right? Yes. So, so the, um, I guess the long, the long side is determined by the potential. Uh-huh. Oh, what about the short side? Also, so this is your, this is your effective potential. So, you know, actually, what you are going to observe, let's say that you're looking at, you know, like Jupiter or Pluto, you're going to observe this. So it, it's telling you what is the shape, you know, at this cut, and the energy that the planet has, what is the, 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 the energy that it has. Right? Uh, if you could put like, you know, a test planet and just increase or decrease the, the kinetic energy, then you could uh, completely find out this shape. Uh, but you know, you're going to have only discrete uh, places where you have the planets. Why are you slicing it as um, two-dimensional shapes? Why are you saying, saying that that curve is like a two-dimensional plot? Well, that's kind of what I'm imagining. Because there's nothing special about this x direction. So you can move it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, like, if you just rotate, you know, the the X around like this, then you get your circle. But then that wouldn't be then an ellipse. You would get, like, a ring. Um, a ring? Or are you mean? rotating over equilibrium? Okay, so let me go to the next thing. I'm not cutting you off. It is, it is relevant. So um, this part over here, you know, it's the, we saw it before, it's R max, uh, which is A1 plus E. And this one is R min which is uh, A1 minus E. So this is the, um, I'm calling it Apple. Um, Apostron, and this is the periostron. So, in your in your elliptical orbit, you're going to have the maximum separation of the two bodies and the closest separation.
And you know, if it's a circular orbit, then R mean equals R, R max. Okay, so So if we compare it to simple harmonic motion, you have your force equals minus du dx, right? So you will have like a spring over here to so maybe compress on this side and elongate it on this side. Um, but you have that extra potential, right? So you have a, a correction to just the, the harmonic motion. So that's why one side is going to be closer than the other. Okay. So I have the R mean, R max, and just as a reminder, This whole thing is 2a, and this will be um, one of the foci. This is the other one. So over here we have L, uh, semi latest rectum. And L is A one minus E squared. E is the eccentricity. So if the eccentricity is zero, so you have a perfect circle, L is equal to A, this is just a circle. Okay, so these Um, this two-body system, right, you have, let's imagine something like Pluto. Um, and it's going to be rotating uh, about the sun, but this whole thing is rotating, the axis, and our mean uh, and our, our max are uh, not going to occur always in the same spot. So this is a little bit like when you're uh, using a, how are, how are those called? Hula hoop or something? There's like a, like a plastic circle and then you drop it on the floor and it makes like these weird uh, shapes, right? So the point of contact with the floor is not always the same, it is rotating. So that is what happens with um, with the orbit. So remember that this angle over here, we call it a script phi or a small phi. So what, what's going to happen is that you might start over here, uh, but it's, instead of, of ending perfectly here because it is rotating a little, you know, it might end kind of over here, a little bit above. And then the next time you know, it, is, it is rotating again, so when it goes to the R main, it might be down here. 
and then this happens uh, continuously. And this happens, you know, for pretty much um, every every orbit, including the Earth. This is called, you know, the angle by which it is changing. So let's say this one, and then this one, and then this one. Um, I guess delta V. is the precession of the orbit. So have you heard about the precession of anything before? No, but I wonder, with respect to what do you measure the angle? Um, where you had your R max initially. But, but how do you notice if it's rotating? Or how do we measure it? Um, I guess you have to measure it against, you know, the, the background. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it, it, it does occur. Is Arturo there or no? You should know this stuff. Uh, he was in class. Oh. And then I guess he's heading back home right now. Oh, I see. Uh, well, yeah, unfortunate. a famous precession is a precession of Mercury. So the precession of Mercury is small but measurable. Um, I guess even for you know, for the Earth is even smaller but it's still measurable. Uh, but this one is maybe like one or two orders of magnitude larger. Uh, so this is the first quantity um, that Einstein predicted with general relativity. So at the time, they couldn't explain the precession of Mercury. So there are a few effects that, that we're going to look at. So yeah, all the, um, all the orbits precede. So, well, I guess to a certain extent. So the precession is going to be related to by how much your potential uh, differs from one over R. Um, so have you heard about uh, multiple expansion? Maybe like in yeah. electromagnetism? Yes, so tell us about it. So it's like, whenever you have two or, or it's more objects, but it's easier to understand with two, like with the dipole. Mm -hmm. um, the, the shape of the field doesn't take like an exactly like circular shape. Right. Especially if they're close together. Mm -hmm. It kind of like bulges um, inward. 
So is there a around relationship the, between the around field? their symmetry? Is, is there a relationship between the field and the potential? Yeah. So, you know, this is a little bit. Uh, you can think about it as a as a Taylor expansion. It's a, I guess it's a different kind of expansion. So, well, the first term is the monopole, right? Uh, what is the second term? The dipole. And what is the dependence? It's one over i squared. And then? And then the, the quadrupole. And what is the dependence? That's one over i cubed. And then, and so on, right? So the next one will be, which one? I think it's the octopole, I don't know, <laughs> I think. Yes, yes, that's right. So you go, you know, it's one, two, four, eight, and so on. So, uh, you know, in this case, I guess this one was negative, so it goes like this. This one was positive, so you get this other part. Um, but you could make, you can be like more and more precise in your description of this potential by adding terms to the multiple uh, expansion. So, this potential is going to, um, what do you think can affect this potential? So that, you know, maybe it will look, I don't know, more like this or something like that. More mass? The mass distribution or, or more mass, yeah, definitely. Other bodies too, maybe? If you are willing to count for more than two? Yeah, yeah, that will be the mass distribution. So also, yeah, also if, you, if you have like a, not point mass, but you know, like an, a finite distribution of mass, this will change. So in general, the mass is going to, the mass distribution is going to change the potential. And uh, general relativity is also going to, to change it because mass also changes space itself. So you can still apply or find, you know, what is the effective potential and you can fit your multiple expansion, even if it is, uh, even if, if it has uh, general relativity effects or anything else. So for example, uh, the sun is not perfectly spherical, but it has, It's more elongated, I mean, it's not a huge effect, but it's there. Um, I guess it's more like that. More elongated, you didn't draw it correctly. <laughs> you get the idea. It's a little wider than it is tall. So, Ramon, you mentioned the how the field looks like. Um, do you know what is the mathematical function that describes the how they look? <clears throat> there's a there's a cosine theta. There's an angle dependence on the on the radius somewhere. <laughs> yeah. For sure. I, I don't know the exact formula. I can't remember it. Well, there's spherical harmonics. Yes. So where else do you see the spherical harmonics? What do you mean? I mean what other mathematical or I guess physics area do you use them? 
Mm, I've only seen them in electromagnetism. Yeah. So they describe the shape of the electrons, right? So the S electrons are <laughs> spherical. And then the P electrons, how many lobes do you have? Two. So you have one like this, and then the other one like this, and the other one like this, right? So this is P. So this is a dipole, is that right? Yeah. And then the D electrons, uh, they have four. They're more difficult to draw. But there's like one here, one here, one here, one here. And you have five different kinds. So you have four lobes. So this is the quadrupole. This is the dipole. This is the monopole. And so on, right? You can go to F or even higher um, spherical harmonics. So can you predict how many lobes the F electrons have? Eight. Eight. So uh, essentially you can describe uh, any, any shape that you want, you know, a, a geometrical shape by uh, putting uh, you know, getting a fraction of this one, and these are like linear combinations, right? So uh, this will be beta, like how many, how much of these, of this one do you want, how much of this one. And so to describe the sun, you know, you probably need um, most of the monopole, and then a little bit of this one that will describe like the equatorial distribution. And then you know, maybe a smaller contribution of the quadrupole just to make it fit perfectly, right? So any distribution that you have, you can uh, describe it using this, this expansion. So this is related to your potential, also to your shape. So the precession, including the general relativity part, is I M G divided by L C squared. This L you can replace it by A one minus E squared. Right? So if we want to calculate the precession for Mercury, well mass of the system is approximately just the mass of the sun. Then A is the uh, semi-major axis. So that is 5.8 times 10 to the um, 10 meters. Uh, the E for Mercury is 0 0.20. And I think that's all we need. C is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. And 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 
So plugging everything in there. And I think this is going to be point eighty six. Okay, so looking everything in there. We got 5.1 times 10 to the negative 7 radians. So, how is this delta V measured? Well, this is how much the angle changes uh, per orbit. So, the number that you usually see, or I guess the famous one, is the angle per century, how much it changes per century. So the orbital, orbital period of Mercury is 88 days, so that's um, in one century, uh, there are three thousand six hundred uh, thirty six thousand five hundred twenty five days. So if we divide by the period, we get uh, 415 orbits per century. So we have to We can multiply it times this one, and we get per century 2.1 times 10 to the negative 4 radians. And usually this is given um, in arc seconds. So there is there are 3,600 seconds in one degree, and will be 360 degrees, two pi, and the 2.1 times 10 to the negative four. So the final number is 43. Arc seconds per century. So tiny, but definitely measurable. Okay, so let's remember that one for later. So we were talking about
Let me see this one. Yes. Gravity, uh, electricity, magnetism. Mono. Dipole and quadrupole. So, how does a gravity monopole looks like? You have your mass. How does the field looks? Um, look. Example. A circle, like equipotentials. potentials. Yeah, or the field. I guess the field just points um, inward. Like this. Yeah. Okay. What about the? Let's say that it's a positive charge, the electric monopole. Any outwards if you have a plus charge, I guess. Like that. What about the magnetic? They don't exist. Not available. How will a magnetic? I mean, how the mass dipole look like? Actually, it will look kind of the same as the mono, right? Maybe just a little change in here. Yeah, with like, I guess, with a zero field in the middle. Is it zero field though? Mm. Yeah, I guess they're both attractive. Yeah, so not zero in the middle. Um, what about the electric one? Well, you just said different color. It's like it flows from plus to minus. Yeah. Oops. So the the, the uh, gravitational dipole and the electric dipole look pretty different. And what about the magnetic one? It looks pretty similar to the electric one, right? So like flowing. So how will this one look like? Looks like a flower from, from a little farther away. Like a flower? So this one wants to go like this, this one like this. So you have a, like a direction over here, right? And this one just go like that. Mm -hmm. 
So you do have your four poles. You have something weird here in the middle. So you can do a quadrupole with the magnets as well. So you can do like north, south, north, south, or the other way around, south, north. It will look kind of like this. What about the one with the masses? So like nothing here in the middle, right? So you will have like an actual shape over here. So if you just grab this mass, yeah, the, the monopole, and you just throw it, let's say like a baseball or something. Is it going to radiate anything? But this uh, the electric one, the electric dipole, if I just grab it and start rotating it, will it radiate something? Light? Yeah, I think so. So this one radiates um, light. So the monopole is not going to radiate anything, um, it is constrained by the conservation of, of mass and energy. So you cannot decrease or increase its mass uh, plus energy uh, by moving it. So this will be conservation of mass energy. The dipole, it's also constrained. Uh, by the conservation of momentum and angular momentum if you rotate it. So a mass dipole or a gravity dipole is not going to radiate anything. But this one, the quadrupole, is going to radiate gravitational waves. So if the sun it's not perfectly symmetrical, uh, spherical. Does it radiate gravitational waves? Yes or no? Yeah, it does. Uh, what if you had a perfectly spherical sun, will it radiate? It wouldn't. No. So whether um, a system you know, is going to radiate gravitational waves depends, or I guess how much, it's going to depend on the quadrupole uh, correction to your potential. So this is kind of interesting because you know, if you have a solid state system in which the forces between every par, uh, pair of atoms, they're harmonic, uh, then, you know, the waves can live forever, there's nothing to stop them. But in reality, there's some interaction, uh, the shape of the potential changes, 
And that's why you have things like uh, heat conduction or thermal expansion, like all these effects. So, um, you know, this is not that different. So the unharmonicity in the orbit of the system, I guess the higher unharmonicity uh, is what produces the, the gravitational radiation. I don't quite get why dipoles can't is the radiate gravitational radiation uh, because they are so you can be in any frame of reference right so they could be moving with some velocity uh, but if there's no force in them the velocity cannot change so the momentum has to be conserved they cannot lose uh, you know, that, that momentum, that energy. Mm, okay. If, if you, if you grab it uh, and rotate it like this one, you know, it doesn't, the shape doesn't shape, doesn't change. It's, it's all the same. Oh, okay. I see. I see. You, you can rotate it in space and it doesn't change. This one does. And that's why it, it, it radiates uh, light. But this one, you know, it has differences. And so when you rotate it, uh, you're actually going to uh, lose energy. I guess you will um, lose the same energy that you put in rotating them. Um, okay, so what is... Uh, you know, the, a, a consequence of the fact that that you can have uh, gravitational radiation is that Here you had your different uh, uh, kinetic energy levels. If you're losing that kinetic energy, the system is going to be moving down here. So eventually, it's going to have um, circular a circular orbit. So. If you know the rate at which the system is radiating gravitational energy, and you know um, how uh, eccentric the orbit is, you can estimate for how long um, they have been orbiting each other. Okay, so see if I. So the um, 1993 Nobel Prize uh, was given to these dudes. Holson uh, Taylor. So they discovered um, So it was a, a pulsar that was, it has, it had some glitches. So instead of getting the perfectly uh, 
periodic pulse. There was a, a variation of about eight hours in which this one you know, will move to this side and this one to the other side. So, you know, they figure out that it was orbiting another body that they couldn't see. And it was um, uh, shifting it. So they call it a glitch. And the other thing that they discovered is that this system was, uh, the, the period was decreasing. So it is, it's called the Holtz-Taylor pulsar. So the mass of one of them, one of the um, neutron stars, one point forty four solar masses, and the other one. 1.39 solar masses. The eccentricity of the system is 0.617. So is this a, a young system or an old system? Pretty young, right? The eccentricity is really high. So they still have a lot of energy that they can radiate out. So the period is 0 0.32 days. So like eight hours. Um, and from the period you can get the semi-major axis. So it's 1.85. times 10 to the nine meters. And the period is decreasing at a rate of negative 2.29 times 10 to the negative 12 per orbit. So the, this distance is lower than, and this is smaller than the orbit of Mercury. So you have these two neutron stars, they have to be because of their, their masses. Uh, one of them is a pulsar, the other one cannot be detected, and they don't know if it's because you know, the pulse is not uh, aligned with us, or it's just a neutron star that is not a pulsar. And so you could fit these two neutron stars in the orbit of Mercury. They orbit around each other every 0.32 days. And what you get for the um, precession is four point twenty two degrees per year. So you know, the effect here is massive as opposed to uh, with, with mercury. And the effect is so massive that you can uh, measure the changes in human lifetimes. And so the, you know, the Nobel Prize was awarded them for uh, a new way to uh, understand general relativity. So it's kind of cool that, you know, with this 
astronomical numbers, we can measure this in human lifetimes. You can see these, these differences. So, another situation in which this um, radiation of gravitational waves is important is when you have two white dwarfs so you have one here let's say that they have similar mass and so as they radiate um, gravitational energy the distance between them is going to decrease and at some point what is what do you think is going to happen they're going to collide and if you have two white dwarfs then what's going to happen when they collide they're going to blow up supernova explosion right so this is another way in which you can have the supernova explosion. So the first one is you have the white dwarf um, with something else, you know, like a main sequence star. And then it starts donating mass to the white dwarf until it goes over the shadow sector limit and explodes. The other one is you have two white dwarfs and their uh, orbits lose energy until they, they collide. So actually there's no, no way to distinguish between these two because we cannot get close enough to, uh, to see them. So this is likely, you know, why we get the uh, type 1a supernovas, but this is another mechanism that will cause them and we just, um, we don't know. So the, the gravitational So the amount of energy that is radiated per unit time, so this is a power um, from gravitational waves is, you can get this from the quadrupole expansion. Average. So if you have two point orbs, this is the 2a, uh, they have the same mass. So the very center is at the center at a. What is the kinetic energy or how can we get it? We have 
has two stars. So let me remove these ones. Uh, what is the, the velocity of each one? Omega r, right? This one, the omega, I'm oh, sorry, the omega. We can get it from uh, Kepler. So we get the kinetic energy this is going to be um, total mass so 2m1 g over a What is the gravitational energy? It's G M one M one squared over A. We have two of them. So the total energy is minus G M one squared over A. So I'm going to finish this one next time. Um, uh, so this is. So if we take, we can get the time derivative of A from this power. To see how the total energy changes with time. And from this, we can estimate uh, when the white dwarfs are going to collide. All right, um, anything else? No? No. All right. Um, so, yeah, I guess stay in contact <laughs> and stay safe. Okay. All right. Stay safe. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Stay safe too. Thanks. <laughs>